For people unfamiliar with you, uh, please tell us your name and what your background is and what you've been doing for the last 40 years or so. <laughs> so my name is Dr. Vandana Shiva. I started my life's journey training in physics and uh, did a PhD on the foundations of quantum theory after doing a master's in particle physics from India. Um, I was absolutely uh, disillusioned with the idea that the world is a machine and therefore the mechanical philosophy proved very inadequate for my intellectual satisfaction and that's why I traveled the quantum way. And for the last 50 years along with um, my training in physics, I also got engaged with the first ecology movement of our times. Uh, it was called Chipko where women came out to hug trees in our region of the Himalaya, and I said I'm going to volunteer every summer, every winter. And that's where my training in ecology and activism started in the early 70s. For the last 31 years, I've been saving seeds. For the last 35 years, I've been looking at the craziness of an agriculture that looks like war and not like growing food. What impact has the change from small-scale organic farming to large-scale farming had on the world? Um, tragically, it has brought the world to a brink. The shift from small-scale agriculture based on diversity, based on care, based on organic systems, which is nothing more than true agriculture, which means care for the land, into an agriculture based on the deployment of war chemicals, Deployment of war machinery, the tractors don't look like they're caring for the soil. They look like combined harvesters at war together and they move like a military formation. The first thing they've done to bring us to the brink is create the greenhouse gases that are leading to climate change. The biggest being nitrogen oxide, which is 300 times more deadly for the climate than carbon dioxide. And everything in mechanical agriculture and industrial farming is based on fossil fuels, including the fertilizers themselves. And then when you imprison animals and separate the animals from the crops and the trees and the farmer and turn livestock economies into prisons of torture, you get massive emissions of methane. You've also created a system which is wasting 50% of the food grown through long distance, through uniformity, through best before dates. All of this makes for 50% food, precious food being thrown away. You've created a situation where a billion people are permanently hungry. It isn't that hunger and famine didn't happen before, but it was localized in space and localized in time. It is now structural and built into the industrial agriculture system, as I've written in my book, uh, Making Peace with the Earth that this is hunger by design. It's in the design of industrialization, of an activity that should be ecological, not industrial. Um, it has led to an explosion of new diseases, the non-communicable chronic diseases. When I was growing up, there was one lady who had cancer and she survived it till she was 90. Today you turn around, every family has a cancer victim and it's the young people were dying of cancer and 70 year old parents are taking care of them. Or look at the autism epidemic. It was one in 260,000, it's one in 45, it's going to be one in 30, it's going to be one in two. That is not what food was supposed to do to us. Rob us of our body and our mind and rob us of our future. So if you look at all the indications, as we've just written a new report called The Future of Our Daily Bread, Regeneration or Collapse, the collapse is staring us in the face. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has said 12 years for changing. Otherwise, in 100 years, we've destroyed the conditions of life on Earth. The Intergovernmental Panel on Biodiversity, which is the other treaty from the Earth Summit, has said 10 years for change. Otherwise, we're going to have desertified, degraded land, oceans of refugees, and no wall will be high enough to keep desperate people out. And the 
the uprooting and displacement in terms of the human tragedy that's already causing. We've done work on how the, whether this the Syrian crisis or the crisis around Lake Chad and the emergence of Boko Haram, they're all related to how industrial agriculture destroyed the water, the land, the soil, uprooted people, created conflicts, and today we have wars without end. Do you think eating a plant-based diet is necessary for the health of the planet? Um, I'm ecological enough to know that wherever there are plants, you should eat plants. And if there are no plants, like in Iceland, um, in Greenland, um, it would be totally unfair to say import tomatoes at very high cost. Um, different ecosystems create different diets. And the small ecological footprint of the diet is what matters in the ecological sense, not a fundamentalism to impose what would be a non-sustainable diet for one place on another place. Um, Eastern nations had lactose intolerance. They've never had, you know, lactose-based diets. That's why they evolved the whole diet based on soya. Um, a plant-based diet is, of course, you know, all life, all life on this planet begins with photosynthesis. The sun shining and making everything we need, with the food we eat, the fiber we wear, including the food for all animals, including humans. Um, I think we need to be pluralistic in everything because I have watched my country destroyed by fundamentalism, as I'm watching America destroyed by all kinds of fundamentalisms. Ecological footprint reduction is vital. I would say factory farming and animal products from our factory farms have no place on a compassionate planet. They should be absolutely stopped. But I would not hound a yak-keeping person in the Tibetan desert, where nothing can grow. Or the camel herder in the Thar Desert, to say, no, you're not going to live on your camel, or its milk, or in the Sahara. I think we need ecological diversity, and the diversity of the mind, and a very clear idea of violence, what, what violence to life is. I believe plant-based diets based on huge monocultures of soya bean, Roundup Ready soya bean sprayed with glyphosate that we now know is a carcinogen, which is tearing down the Amazon, which has destroyed the savannas and the forests of Argentina. This plant-based diet is part of the violence against the planet and the local people. Why should we be concerned about animals? Does it really make a difference how we treat them? Um, I come from a civilization that calls itself Vasudheva Kutumbakam, the earth as one family. And whether it be the microbe in your gut or other animals, because we are animals, we forget we are animals. We think animals are outside humans. No, we are animals. We'd better be compassionate to other humans. We'd better be compassionate to all life on earth because it's a condition of our being. We depend on life on Earth. We are a continuum. And I think colonialism, the anthropocentrism, the patriarchy, the racism that it gave birth to, that bundle of funny emotions and hierarchies 500 years ago, um, it is a very violent system. And it's a system based on exclusion. And it's a system that declared that the Earth was dead, which got accelerated after the finding of coal and fossil fuels, you know, to define living systems as dead and movement and creativity coming out of dead fossil carbon. Uh, the definition of nature as dead also defined animals as merely milk machines or meat machines. And that is a violation of the way the earth works. She's living, she's Gaia. 
It's a violation of the rights of all beings. We have worked together on the rights of Mother Earth and all her beings as a declaration that's parallel to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And the violation of all beings can also be a violation to plant beings because not only are we waking up slowly in the industrial world that animals are sentient beings, we're waking up to the fact that plants are sentient beings too. What's going on with insects and pollinators? Are their numbers declining and how does that affect us? In industrial agriculture, wherever they're spraying of pesticides, wherever they're spraying of Roundup, which kills the plants on which the monarch butterfly, for example, feeds, you have a decline of 90% in the monarch butterfly population. In intensively farmed, chemically intensively farmed area, you have 75% disappearance of the bee population. On the other hand, when we do biodiversity sensitive farming, as in Navdanya, the movement I started, on our farm in Dehradun, that is a research conservation and teaching farm, we just did a study. The pollinators are six times more than in the forest. So the forest is the highest that nature creates in that ecosystem. But just by planting lots of diversity and creating lots of food for different pollinators, we've created a pollinator sanctuary when all we were doing was saving seeds. It was a seed bank. On the other hand, in the areas where Bt toxin is grown, Bt cotton, now Bt cotton has a toxin in it which is in every cell of the plant. It's in the pollen of the plant. Our studies are showing there's not a single pollinator on a Bt cotton plant. If you were in charge of the food system in the United States and the rest of the world, what five to ten action steps would you take? The first thing i do is stop subsidizing the poison makers and the killers of the planet and our health. I would actually put out a bill to say you owe this much to society for the harm you have done. After all, there's a principle called polluters should pay. Toxic polluters should pay for the damage they've done. The second is to have all this managed, I'll have to make my regulatory agencies independent of the influence of these toxic giants. The third thing, America has emptied out its countryside and, and this model is being forced on the rest of the world. I would stop using the State Department and the White House to destroy sustainable, nonviolent small farm systems of the rest of the world that provide 80% of the food we eat and actually heal the earth while they're growing the food. I would stop using foreign policy as an arm to destroy the rest of the world. So protect small farmers where they are and rejuvenate small farms in America. Every time I give a call, talk in this country in universities, if by the way, I will ask a question. How many of you would be farmers if you could? 80% of the hands go up. That's what young people want to do. They don't want to be on Wall Street. They don't want to be in Silicon Valley. The ones who are thinking about where is the planet going and they can watch the precipice. They say, I want to be part of the regeneration. And I think we need very, very creative systems that allow the land that is today controlled and owned by investors and banks, because every farmer is in debt, the farmer driving the tractor, and tomorrow the tractor driving itself is not a farm anymore in the sense that there's an owner called the farmer. It's the financial system that's taken over. And like Wall Street was bailed out with $13 trillion in 2008 collapse, in effect, the agriculture policies are bailing out the financial system every day. It is time to take the land back and put it in the hands of the young people who are dying to be part of the healing of the earth. And finally, we need to see food as health, not food as a commodity that destroys our health. And therefore, our farmers should be rewarded for growing good food. We should have farmers markets everywhere. 
we should not subsidize bad food that appears cheap and therefore to the poor the only option. We should let the true prices speak, and in true prices, the local, organic, biodiverse, fresh will win as the first choice of the last person. Regarding seeds, what are the most important things a person can do to preserve heirloom seeds, stop GMOs, uh, preserve our topsoil, stop the use of chemicals, and stop the overuse and misuse of water? Well, all of the problems that you have stated are linked to the seed. It's when chemical industry started to be, breed seed to have more chemical use, that seeds started to need more water. And therefore water and agriculture became water intensive. My research has shown 10 times more use of water to grow the same amount of food under chemical conditions compared to organic. The second thing that happened was that monoculture seeds grown with chemicals also then invited mechanization of a large scale that started to destroy the soil. What can every ordinary person do for the seed? First remember that anything you eat begins as seed. And therefore, if you're thoughtful about what you're eating, you need be, to be thoughtful about the seed. The measures and criteria of seed breeding have robbed our plants of their nutrition and filled them with toxics. And therefore, they've robbed our diets of nutrition and filled our bodies with toxics. So, a, we must start looking for food grown from what you call heirloom seeds, I call open pollinated seeds, I call seeds that are living seeds, not seeds that have been killed of their energy, either through technologies that uh, put too much toxics like GMOs, or even the attempt of Monsanto to make the terminator seed, to make sterile seed, I mean, can you imagine seed that won't give you sprouts? And if it won't give you sprouts, what kind of benefit to your body is it going to bring? So to make sure you eat food that's GMO-free, free of chemicals, free of the deprivation of nutrients in the seed. And that means you must shift to heirloom seed. Now, as an eater, you need to eat food from heirloom seeds. But I think I invite everybody to say, adopt at least one seed and say, I'll take care of you. It could be a little basil in your windowsill. It could be a tulsi. It could be one tomato plant. Because with that commitment, you are not only committing yourself to the continuity of life, you're committing yourself to the abundance that that seed create. One tiny tobacco seeds will give you thousands. And you'll realize that this scaremongering of scarcity that the industrial system creates to make us dependent on buying junk food, that that is a system we can create an alternative to. And the alternative begins in a little seed. What is in soil that's so important? In soil is life. All ancient cultures, which did not have microscopes, knew there's life in the soil. And that's why in Indian culture, we have an Atharva Ved, an ancient Ved, that says, I will tell you, Mother Earth, but I promise to not wound you in trying to get my food. And I'll never take more than is absolutely necessary for those who depend on me. And even more importantly, in an old Veda, 4,000 years ago, it said, in this handful of soil is your future. Take care of it, it will take care of you. Destroy it, it will destroy you. The history of every civilization that has been wiped out is a history of the destruction of soil. And the fact that India has continued for 10,000 years, farming in gentle ways, is because we took care of the soil long before we knew microscopically what's in it. The British sent an agricultural scientist. At that time, there was no agriculture science. He was called the economic botanist, Albert Howard, to India to introduce industrial farming. 
commodity farming. He arrived and he says in his book, The Agricultural Testament, I arrived and saw the soils were fertile. There were no pests in the field. I decided to make the Indian peasant my professor. The book he wrote called The Agricultural Testament is called The Bible of Modern Organic Farming. It's been published by Rodale in America, Soil Association in England, and the modern organic farming grew from these systems. What were these systems? These were the ancient systems of taking care of the soil. But what Howard did was use his scientific training to understand why the systems that Indian peasants had used had created lasting systems and perennial systems. And as he says, farming here is as permanent as the prairie, as the forest, as the ocean. And the two laws he learned were the law of biodiversity and the law of return. We must give back. And he focused on the trillions and trillions of soil microorganisms there are. He focused on the mycorrhizal fungi, which is the fungi that they're now finding that in a cubic inch of soil, it's eight miles of it. And it can go to a tree far away and pick up the nutrients and to bring it to a plant that is impoverished. They've done new experiments that have shut off nutrition to particular plants. And they find the soil fungi is redistributing nutrition and creating a soil food web. There's new research that's showing that the soil is a much richer communication system than the World Wide Web. They call it the soil web. There's more communication going on. And even Darwin, who's only cited in industrial society as supporting competition, which wasn't true, they distorted the reading of the survival of the species. He's written two books that to me are extremely important. Not very popular, not very read. I think every school child and every college student should be reading it. One is called The Mold. It's about the earthworm. And Darwin writes, when the history of human evolution is written, this species will get the credit for supporting humanity. Because it's the earthworm mold is what is the true fertilizer, much more efficient than all the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium we apply, much more efficient in giving us micronutrients. And the second extremely important book that he wrote was on the root of the plant, which he called the brain of the plant. And he's talking about the amazing communication going on between the root and the soil microorganisms, including the fact that those who are now fascinated with the plant-based diet, in India we knew plants can fix nitrogen and give us good protein. At the time, the West had no idea that either of these things are possible. For them, protein came from meat and nitrogen came from synthetic fertilizer. The rhizobium in the root of the leguminous plant, the nitrogen-fixing plant, is a non-violent alternative to the violent systems of creating synthetic fertilizers by blasting fossil fuels at very high temperature to then ruin the soil, kill every soil organism, ruin the water with nitrogen runoff and the dead zones, and ruin the atmosphere with nitrous oxide. Uh, we have to learn from the soil how to live together as humanity. And we've done a manifesto called Terra Viva. People can go to the website of Seed Freedom to see it. Terra Viva is about our soil, our commons, our future. And while doing it, we realized that the world for fertile soil in Latin is humus. The root of the word for humanity is humus. We are the soil. How has the number of varieties of foods changed in the last 100 years? How many varieties of each food crop existed 100 years ago versus today, and, and does this matter? We used to eat 1,200 species of plants across different cultures in the world, 1,200 species. And in each species, there were hundreds of varieties. Take, for example, 
the rice. It was evolved from a wild plant called Oryza sativa. Indian peasants evolved 200,000 rice varieties, 200,000. The Mexican peasants and the peasants in Mesoamerica took one wild plant called the Teosinte and turned it into thousands of varieties of corn of every color. Why does diversity matter? Diversity matters first and foremost because each crop was bred for particular reasons. It could be different tastes, different processing qualities. It could be different climate conditions. We have saved rice varieties that can tolerate salt. So when the climate change cyclones and hurricanes come, farmers don't lose a crop. We have rejuvenated agriculture after the Orissa super cyclone, after the tsunami, after cyclone Phelan. This salt tolerance trait would have been wiped out with the Green Revolution push, but we saved the seeds. We've saved 4,000 varieties of rice. We've saved every lentil and every pulse and legume that Indians ate. So for nutrition, for taste, for health, for resilience, we need the diversity. Diversity is not a luxury. It's the essence of life. Pro-GMO people say that GMOs have been used successfully to save the Hawaiian papaya industry. Does this mean to you that GMOs have a place in our food system? No, GMOs don't have a place in our food system just because it's an extremely crude technology of shooting with a gene gun a trait adding with it antibiotic resistance markers, adding viral promoters, when for every trait that has been added like this, there are much more sophisticated alternatives. The Hawaiian papaya is one example, but 99.9% .9 GMOs are accounted for by herbicide-resistant crops, mainly Roundup Ready soy and corn, and by Bt toxin crops. Both of these were supposed to control pests and weeds. The Bt crops were supposed to control pests. The Roundup Ready herbicide tolerant crops were supposed to control weeds. What do we have within less than a decade of their use? We have super pests. The boll worm is now attacking the Bt crop, which is supposed to be controlling it. And its trade name is called boll guard. It guards against the boll worm, but the boll worm has outwitted the technology. In the United States, half the farmlands are overtaken by weeds that can't be controlled by Roundup, and now they're spreading dicamba, which has ruined neighboring farmers. The drift is so high. There are many sophisticated ways to control weeds through ecological farming. In Navdanya, we have zero pests on our farm through diversity, because when you have diversity of plants, you have diversity of insects, and you have an amazing system of relationship between friendly insects that control the others that could destroy a crop. Ecological pest control is now established as the only sustainable way to regulate pest population. And the same goes for viruses. Give the banana, papaya good nutrition, good soil nutrition, and select from varieties the virus-resistant papayas, you don't need GMOs. So the idea is the only way. I mean, when I started to save seeds, and we had saved the salt-tolerant varieties, Monsanto was putting up ads to say, oh my God, climate change, nine billion people to feed. Without GMOs, we won't be able to f do the work. No, all you did was try and steal our climate-resilient seeds. That's not brilliance. And Good science does not need propaganda. Good science has worked in the quiet. The loudness of the propaganda machine that is a necessary companion of the biotech industry is something that should worry people. How long before water shortages affect the Western lifestyle? I think water shortages are already affecting large parts of the West and the Western lifestyle. I'll give you just two examples. The Californian drought 
is already having very, very high costs. California is a desert. It should have been farmed like a desert. It shouldn't have been mining the aquifers. It shouldn't have been diverting the rivers for the intensive irrigation for industrial farming. Or take the story of Syria. The Western lifestyle included the Western agriculture. Syria is part of the Fertile Crescent, which is where we started the farming of wheat and oats and barley. Today, the Fertile Crescent is a devastated area. And our studies show that the way the Green Revolution has ruined Punjab in India and created a water crisis, I can even show you uh, a diagram if I can find it very quickly for you. Because of the 10 times higher use of water in industrial farming, the most fertile area of India, the land of the five rivers, Punjab means Panj is five, Ab is the five waters. The most fertile, most water abundant part is a red zone because of chemical farming, because of industrial agriculture. But if you were to apply exactly this image to Syria, you'd find in 2009, the groundwater was finished. The rain was failing because of climate change and a severe drought. A million peasants were uprooted. 75% of the livestock was destroyed. The million refugees moved to the cities. All they wanted was relief. The World Bank structural adjustment doesn't allow governments to help farmers. And within two years, war interests had found an opportunity. And today, Syria is a land of an unending war. Who's fighting whom? Nobody knows anymore. But I know half of Syria is a refugee living outside Syria. How many chemical companies are there compared to, say, 50 years ago, and does that matter? 50 years ago, there have been thousands and thousands of chemical companies and thousands of seed companies. Last year, they have merged into a cartel of three. The smaller companies were bought up by the bigger giants who have now concentrated themselves. So Monsanto bought up all the seed companies of the world. Now it has merged with Bayer. Dow and DuPont bought up a lot of seed companies, including Pioneer Hybrid. They've merged. Syngenta, which was already a merger of Seba, Sandoz, Astra, and Zeneca, has merged with ChemChina, the big Chinese chemical company. So we have a cartel of three, came out of Hitler's Germany, controlling agrochemicals and making it, they fooled the world over a century to believe that without chemicals we can't grow food. In the 80s, they started to take control over the seed through genetic engineering and patenting and the trade treaties. And now they have merged and they want to control knowledge, data, science, media, what we eat. For me, the existence of these three giants who are toxic giants, I call them the poison cartel, is that kind of unaccountable power is a death sentence for the planet and people. We know their contributions to the extinction of species is huge. Rachel Carson had woken the, us up to this in the 70s, and we're still sleepwalking. If we had listened to Silent Spring, we'd have banned these companies then. It's time to ban them now. 80% species have disappeared in, from the 70s onwards when industrial agriculture has spread further. And all the toxic pollution and all the diseases. We know only 5% cancers have genetic roots. 95% come from toxics in the environment and in our food. It, it's 
whether it's the life of human beings or the life of the planet and other species. A cartel of three poison makers cannot coexist with life on Earth. You have to make a choice. I started working on agriculture issues. As I mentioned, I'm tra it was trained in physics, and agriculture was not my field of training. But it was 1984 and the disasters of Bhopal, when a pesticide plant, now owned by Dow, earlier by Union Carbide, leaked in the city of Bhopal and killed thousands. And uh, the same year, Punjab, which is where I'd studied and done my MSc honors in physics, had become a land of war. 30,000 were killed in Punjab. 30,000 were killed in Bhopal. And I was working for the United Nations University and wrote a book then called The Violence of the Green Revolution, which was the first kind of social ecological assessment in our part of the world of what chemical farming had done. Uh, because it was a fresh look, I started to get invited. And disinvites would follow very fast because the poison cartel could not deal with the truth of how much harm they had done. And it wasn't the case that they had turned India from a famine-stricken country into a country that had food. We had food. We had food now. We had food then. All they did was spread rice and wheat monocultures and destroyed our pulses, our oil seeds, our vegetables, our fruits, and destroyed the biodiversity. But it's really after 87 when I was at a meeting where they said so clearly that they were going to spread GMOs in order to take patents and they were use, going to use the GATT, the General Agreement on Trade and Tariffs, which became the WTO, to impose laws that would make it illegal for farmers to have their own seeds. That's when I decided to save seeds, but that's when I started to watch these companies. So I filed, filed cases when they came illegally to India, and I had direct threats, I had direct life threats. Um, I continued to do my work because I'm guided by my conscience, I'm guided by seeking truth. And then they tried to silence me totally. I mean, I had the massive propaganda machinery work. That's why I know there's a propaganda machinery at work, because they've targeted me, and I know where it comes from. And uh, I just continued to do the work for truth, because fear is something that's cultivated. And I'm fortunate that I've had a family. I've had a Gandhian tradition that cultivates fearlessness. Um, if the poison cartel had their way, I wouldn't be here just now. I wouldn't be speaking. Are pesticides, fungicides, herbicides, insecticides, and other chemicals safe for people, pollinators, the food system, the soil, the water, and the planet? Well, the word insecticide, fungicide, pesticide, herbicide, tells you they're designed to kill. And every one of the chemicals we use in agriculture were originally designed for war, to kill people, human beings. Pesticides have their origins in the gases used in Hitler's gas chambers, Zylon B. Herbicides, the first big popular use was Agent Orange in the Vietnam War. The veterans are there to see how safe they are for us. The Children being born deformed in Vietnam today are there for us to see how safe they are. Something designed to kill will kill. To then, having designed it to kill, to say no, it won't kill, is the most blatant lie that can be spoken, hiding behind a pseudoscience. Because real science teaches you not only that they are unnecessary because there are better ways to farm and produce food, but their, their hazards are real. I have watched so many scientists being sacrificed because they did real science. Arpad Putsai, Eric Saralini, Ignacio Chapella. We could do a whole book that thick on the good science that was silenced, except that some people won't be silenced. Ignacio refused to be silent. Saralini refused to be silent. But Arpad got a stroke because he was such a 
a deep scientist working in his lab. He didn't even know the real world of brutality out there behind these poison makers. What is the state of water shortages throughout the world as of 2019? If you were to ask me in the various threats humanity faces, what are the most urgent? I think the most urgent is that we are being made to grow on hate and we can kill each other before chronic diseases kill us. Just the hate phenomena. Look at the number of conflicts that have been created along lines where there was no problem in the past. Land and water, land degradation and water crisis are the second most urgent. They already are very urgent in large parts of the world and a major reason for the massive migration from rural areas to urban areas is that industrial agriculture, chemically intensive, water intensive, energy intensive, capital intensive, has so dispossessed the farmers and so destroyed the soils, people can't make a living in farming anymore. And when most of the world is farming, you know, in the US you might think most of the world isn't farming because you've reduced your farming population to a number that's smaller than the number of people in the jails here, but most of the world farms for a living. And when that's taken away from them, they're refugees. And when too many livelihoods are taken away from a society, you get a crime economy. I was at a tribunal, public tribunal in Mexico, which started to get destroyed with NAFTA and then the WTO. And at this tribunal, which was actually on corn, on the GMO corn, which they haven't yet allowed to enter, there was an economist who was presenting the data and said with the destruction of peasant livelihoods and small scale entrepreneurship, one third of Mexico's economy was now a crime economy. If you read the statements of those who took the long caravan from Honduras through Mexico, each of them is talking about the end of farming and the rise of crime as making life impossible where they are. So we have to make peace with the earth and we have to make peace within our societies and there's only one way, ecological farming systems. Farming in my view, you know, when I was young and I chose to be a physicist, understanding the world was the most urgent task for me. Today, good farming is the most urgent task. What is the ideal system for farming? Because the planet is so diverse, we can only identify the ideal principles that should be in all good farming systems that produce good food. Some places, there'll be more plants. In some places, there'll be more animals. In some places, there'll be more trees. In some places, there'll be more annual crops. Some places will be rice and some places will be corn. So uniformity is an enemy of good farming. Diversity is the signature of good farming, both diversity within the farm and diversity across farming systems. But I increasingly feel that the diversity of the farm includes diversity of cultures now. Because it's farming that creates different and unique cultures. This is what has created all the languages. In, among the ex Eskimos, the numbers of words they have for the snowflakes, that they can distinguish each. In the Rajasthan desert in India, they have a hundred ways of describing a raindrop because the raindrop is so scarce. That diversity, which makes for culture, which makes for knowledge, which are minds, is particularly in this period of the hype on digital agriculture and the hype on artificial intelligence and robotics. It's extremely important to remember there's so many kinds of intelligences. There's diversity of intelligences. There's a diversity of intelligence in the plant, in the animal, in the soil, in our gut, in every cell of our bodies. We can't allow ourselves to forget 
that because that's going to be the guide for rescuing ourselves from this destructive system. The second is related to the fact that colonialism was based on violence and the fossil fuel system of the economy, including agriculture, was based on extraction. You know? Here was fossil carbon nature had put underground and over 600 million years turned into gas and oil. And we learned how to pull out 20 million each year and burn it up. And that's the root of the climate crisis. But this became a model for how to make economies and how to do agriculture. The extractive system, just take. The ideal farming systems has to be based on giving. Giving back to the soil, giving back to the farmer a fair price, giving back to society. And that is how we'll get rid of the agrarian crisis. We'll get rid of the low prices farmers are giving, getting. We'll get rid of the desertification of the soil. And we're going to get rid of the chronic disease epidemic because it's in giving we receive. Please explain what it means when you say that Monsanto has bought the biggest climate data corporation and soil data corporation. Well, Monsanto has bought up the world's biggest climate data corporation and uh, the soil data corporation called Solum. And uh, this is about three, four years ago because Monsanto is recognizing that climate change is a big issue. They're not taking responsibility for being big contributors to it, but they want to make future profits out of it. So when the climate data is controlled by the same corporations that are pushing chemical farming, and the soil data is controlled by them, and the insurance is controlled by them, they're looking at three to four trillion dollars of future profits. The big data language that's being increasingly used is nothing but taking the soil climate data, which actually is a public good, the soil data which should be a public good. In fact, every farmer should know their soil. Right now, Monsanto works with John Deere, and it puts spyware into the tractor. And as the tractor goes over the soil, it picks up this much nitrogen, this much phosphorus, this much potassium, this much water sends that data to Monsanto. Monsanto then sells it back to the farmer as the new data commodity. That's where the control over climate data, control over soil data is coming in in the new big data economy that Monsanto calls digital agriculture and says it'll be farming without farmers. Is carbon data trading a good solution? I don't think any solution based on trade can find a way out of the crisis which comes from our separation from the earth. I think there's only one solution to healing the carbon cycle. The carbon cycle, the earth has enough capacity to reabsorb all the carbon dioxide she emits. We exhale carbon dioxide, the trees use it, to give us oxygen. Those systems are miraculous, and they have worked for billions of years. The broken carbon cycle is linked to mining for fossil fuels and burning up fossil fuels, so that what you're putting in the atmosphere is way beyond the planet's capacity to reabsorb. But while you're doing that, you're also destabilizing the planet herself. So not only are you growing soybeans in the Amazon, to do that, you must cut the Amazon. The Amazon is the lung of the planet. The capacity to absorb goes down. So you're emitting more, absorbing less, that's the disaster in which we are. There's only one way we can get out of this. Emit less, absorb more, absorb more by planting more trees, doing more biodiverse intensive agriculture, putting more carbon through the plants back into the soil, that's the kind of agriculture we practice. And organic content on our farm has gone up 100% in 20 years. The organic matter is built up. This is carbon dioxide pulled out of the atmosphere, made soils 
making soils fertile. We need to pull carbon out of the atmosphere where it does not belong, excess amounts doesn't belong, and put it into the soil where it does belong. This system of the law of return of the cyclical economy can only be done through ecological farming. Trade cannot short circuit it. It can fool us because we've got so used to thinking money is the solution. But money cannot be a solution to ecological problems. Ecological solutions are solutions to ecological problems. What influence do the richer countries have on Africa, India, and, and poorer countries? It's extremely sad to watch how governments of the rich country have become sales agents of the chemical industry. And the billionaires who become billionaires because of deregulation, because of globalization, have merged with government aid. And a very, very good example is the Alliance for the Green Revolution in Africa. The Green Revolution has devastated India. It was imposed on us by the Americans, the chemical industry. Africa is now facing this imposition, and Bill Gates is driving it. The Gates Foundation is a very big player in how to do bad agriculture. Other ways in which rich countries' governments influence what happens in Asia, in Africa, is because they turn aid into the creation of markets. This used to happen with World Bank. I remember when I used to do world studies on the World Bank. For every dollar of aid the World Bank gives, three dollars of business is generated. And we get indebted. And each time we get more deeply indebted, we have to privatize more of our health system, our energy system, our transport systems. Our agriculture is more corporatized. We have more hunger, we have more disease, we have more poverty. And of course, it's so easy to cook up figures that it's very, very easy to say less people are hungry while more people are hungry, to say less people are poor while more people are poor. You alienate people from their land and make them dependent on buying everything. And you say, oh, they're buying more, therefore they're richer. No, they're buying more because they couldn't produce anything for themselves. So the numbers game, whether it's the GDP, the gross domestic product, or it is the measurement of malnutrition, all of these are so manipulated in order to make systems that make the crisis deeper look like solutions. And right now there's a total continuum between the billionaires, their so-called philanthropy, the governments, and the poison cartel. It's one big lump of destruction of democracy. Do you believe it's because the philanthropists are simply brainwashed by the poison cartel? Um, or do you think they're in on it? Uh, I think people like Bill Gates are very much in on it because everything he gives to, in fact, my new book, Oneness Versus the One Percent, is very detailed research on how every place he gives money is a future investment. He gives with one hand in the name of philanthropy, and with the other hand, he's creating a market. And I'll give you a very simple example. So we had the first generation GMOs with which were the herbicide tolerant and the Bt toxin, and Gates had no role in this. But there's an attempt to create a new generation of GMOs based on gene editing and gene drives. And Bill Gates is a very big hand in it. So he's created a private company. He, he's giving money for the research. He's giving money for the patenting. He is also invested in a firm called Editas, which owns the patents on all gene editing. So of course he's pushing this totally unreliable failed technology to make it look like a miracle, because the investments are in that field. I think the PR machine is what is robbing us of our ability to think independently and make decisions for the good of the planet and our own welfare. Uh, what do you see as the importance of the Real Truth About Health Conference? Well, the first thing that attracted me 
when I got the invitation from the Real Truth About Health conference was the three words in the conference title, real, truth, and health. Because my work, I mean, I'm an ecologist. I started to work on seeds because of my passion for biodiversity and the freedom of life on Earth. But today I'm realizing, without having sought answers for health problems, that in good farming are the solutions to good food. That actually a real farmer producing real food is giving us real health. And that any platform for real truth is the place for freedom and democracy in this world of post-truth, where the poison cartel rules our agriculture and our health, because the same people give us cancer and then sell us the patented cancer drug. It's the same poison cartel. Grew out of Hitler's Germany. I think it's extremely important to have platforms where people and hear the truth and follow it up independently, independent of the din of the post facts, of the post truth, the fake articles planted where in the Monsanto papers and the case in, um, in California, it's all out now. How many scientific papers, how much media reportage has been ghostwritten by Monsanto? Places like the Real Truth About Health Conference, are places to speak honestly and hear the truth.